Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Views and News and I'm Faisal Rahman live uh, from our Islamabad studios. Today we'll be talking about the ongoing Ukraine-Russia crisis. Now there's a lot of development during the last couple of uh, days, I would say. Uh, today uh, I heard President Macron, the French president, in fact uh, vowing that he is going to give full support to the Ukrainian people and uh, soon there's going to be a lot of uh, money pouring in for the uh, primarily help of the people who are still stuck inside Ukraine. According to the data, around 6 million uh, refugees are in different countries in Europe. That includes Poland, Romania and a lot of other countries. But having said that, the problem is still there. Now, the Russians, they are demanding that the fuel they are providing to the Europeans, whether it is in the form of coal, gas or petrol or diesel, as they call it, uh, they will be paying in rubles, which the Europeans are not agreeing to, number one. A lot of countries now have decided not to buy fuel from the Russians in the coming years or in the near future also. They are looking for a lot of different alternatives and that is going to definitely give a lot of hit to the uh, Russian finances. A lot of banks, they have uh, proposed some very strict sanctions along with the previous ones which are still there. You talk about another very important factor and that is about Finland and Sweden becoming a part of NATO. What sort of a fallout factor is that going to have? That is again a million dollar question. But last but not the least, uh, the President of the United States of America, Mr. Joe Biden, who visited the Lockheed Martin's uh, setup where they are preparing the Javelin missiles and they have doubled their production. So along with the 50, 60 billion dollars that the Americans will uh, give in the form of uh, financial support to the Ukrainians, there is a lot more on its way. This is where the Russians believe now that they will hit all the convoys who are bringing in uh, the support, uh, the military support or the tangible support or the military hardware uh, for the Ukrainians. Well, the Ukrainians so far, they have put up a very strong fight according to the Ukrainian sources. They've been able to, in fact, uh, get hold of certain villages which were earlier in the control of the Russians. So the fighting is going on. This guerrilla tactics is something which is really going to uh, be very, very difficult for the Russians to manage. Because when you're talking about occupying a city, or perhaps there are also reports that the Russians now will go out uh, as a complete force where they'll be using the reserves uh, also, the reserve soldiers. So that means that full occupation of Ukraine, where will that lead? Now that is something which is a very, very important question, especially for the Europeans. Other than that, when you talk about uh, the edible oil or you talk about the wheat, and especially countries like Pakistan, there is going to be an acute shortage of wheat and a couple of other uh, food products. That is going to be the problem again. As we all know that uh, around 30% of the total wheat is produced in Ukraine and Russia. So this time in Pakistan also, as we all know that recently <coughs> the harvesting of uh, wheat was going on. But imagine in Ukraine they could not harvest just because of the reason that there is this war going on. So just imagine this is what it is going to be like in the future. So to, to talk about it, let me quickly introduce you to our panelists. We have with us in our studio on my uh, right is uh, Dr. Nazim Mahmoud Saab, senior columnist, journalist and a political commentator. Thank you so much Dr. Saab for your time. And uh, we also have with us uh, from Germany, Helga Zeplaro. She is the founder, chairwoman of Schroeder Institute. Ma'am, pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll also be talking and to we'll also be talking. Dr. Akdas uh, Afzal, Senior Economist, Assistant Professor of Economics, uh, Habib University. He is going to join us on the uh, telephone. But let me put the first question to you, Nazir Saab, now looking at the current situation. Yes, we have been doing so many programs on this particular issue. But now it seems that uh, there was a time where they could have controlled or put a check on the fight. But now it seems that it is beyond their imagination. The kind of firepower that the Russians have, which they have not used yet, is unbelievable. So it's almost parallel to the Americans. Vladimir Putin is a man 
who believes in business. Now, for example, uh, you know, going after the personal accounts uh, in Europe of the uh, children of Vladimir Putin, the daughters, or his girlfriend for that matter, or his close allies now, that is going to put him under a lot of pressure at the basic level. Other than that, sir, I think most of the goals which the Russians had in their mind, uh, they have not been achieved so far despite the loss of around a dozen generals, sir. You're talking about some senior four-star generals. And at the same time, when you look at the kind of sanctions that are being imposed, or will also be imposed in the future, that is not something which the Russians would like to have. You talk about the port in Belgium, sir. We all know that all the imports of the Russians, they are stuck there. They are in the uh, Belgian custody at the moment. That is a problem. You talk about their exports of energy resources. That is going to be under the supervision of the Americans soon, I believe, because we all know uh, the Europeans, they have categorically mentioned that now we will not depend on the energy resources coming in from the eastern side, rather USA or Qatar or perhaps Iran. Even Venezuela, uh, for that matter, uh, could be the future suppliers to Europe. Looking at all this, what is happening, sir, it's an absolute mess. Is it leading to a further problem for the Europeans, sir? Or you think there could be a way out and precious lives could be saved? Well, I don't see any way out other than Russian pull out from Ukraine. And that put, President Putin is not ready to do. So what that means? That means uh, I see uh, an escalation uh, in war. And uh, the Russian uh, dream or expectation to quickly occupy Ukraine and uh, finish off with the Zelensky government, uh, they could not do. And uh, the war is already in its third month, which is, which is a lot of time, you know. It's a long time for a country like Russia being unable to consolidate its position. So the resistance that is uh, being given by Ukrainian people, Ukrainian soldiers, that is probably something Russia did not ex expect. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I see, I see that this uh, war is going to last for a long time. It will be devastating not only for uh, Russia. Well, I feel for the Ukraine because Ukrainian people are the ones who will be at the receiving end and who will be in the long run, uh, they, will, they will suffer a lot. And uh, the responsibility to this, to me, there are some people who say that, well, both sides, West is also responsible, European Union is also responsible, and Russia is also responsible. I don't, I don't say that. I think that, you know, um, for this mess, Russia and Putin is responsible. Because the Putin, uh, the Russian argument that Ukraine was going to join NATO, well, Ukraine had not joined. And for that matter, there were other uh, so many countries on the eastern, in the Eastern Europe, including Lit Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, all these countries were already in NATO and they are already in the striking distance. So if they wanted to attack Russia, they could have done from there. So I think this was simply a hypothetical uh, excuse that was Russia gave. Was done to, in fact, disclose the Zelensky government? Pardon? That was, I mean, perhaps this was the only reason to dislodge the Zelensky government or... Uh, maybe get someone of their own choice to be the president of uh, Ukraine? Well, the main purpose was not even to destroy. Of course, they, that might be. But behind that, as I have uh, probably once uh, previously also I mentioned, that uh, Putin has been in power for almost quarter of a century now, 23 years Correct. from 1999. And he has been ruling as a dictator. Now, all Russian people didn't, don't like him. There was increasing resistance against him. He was losing his popularity. He wanted, as it happens, you know, with most dictators, when they lose their popularity inside in the country, they want to boost up nationalism and patriotic feeling in their people so that they can continue in their rule. So that was, I think, the primary reason why he instigated this war. He, Putin wants to continue for another, let's say, 10 years. As long as he's alive, I think he wants to be a lifelong dictator. So I think that that was the main reason behind it. So he used Ukraine as an excuse to initiate that war. And that war, I think, might be undoing of Putin himself. Last quick comment before I uh, move on to the lady in, in Germany. You think this situation seems to be pretty similar uh, 
for the Russians when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, sir? Because I had put this question to so many uh, senior analysts and they believe, no, no, it won't be like that because Afghan Jihad was very different. Now, this time, sir, you're getting a lot of support, not from the Muslim countries when the Mujahideen were supported by UAE, Saudi Arabia, even Egypt, USA, obviously, and Pakistan. But this, in this particular case, it seems that the entire European Union, along with all the American allies, they are there. There are similarities and there are differences uh, if you compare with uh, the situation in Afghanistan. You know, in Afghanistan, the uh, Soviet Union stayed for 10 years. And ultimately, what happened? Ultimately, the Soviet Union had to withdraw. And the same thing is going to happen here also. Uh, Russia ultimately had to withdraw. I mean, it's, it's not possible. Even if Russia is able to occupy the whole of Ukraine, what next? R the Ukrainian people are not going to accept Russia as an occupying legitimate power. At the most, Russia can retain the bordering area like Luhansk and uh, Gdansk. The Donbas region, probably Russia can the area, you know, uh, uh, pr pretty much uh, north of uh, uh, Crimea also. Yes, that is Mariupol and all. Mm -hmm. So that region, maybe Russia is able to uh, keep it. But uh, even if it occupies the whole of Ukraine, in the long run, Russia will be on the losing side because the hatred among Ukrainian people against Russian and hatred that it has generated in European Union and uh, the world over. I mean, Russia is going to pay the price for this hatred for generations to come. It will not be easy. It's, and that is the difference. You know, uh, probably the invasion of Afghanistan did not create that, mu that much hatred around the world against Russia, which this invasion of Ukraine has uh, created. And uh, Russia is, as I said, Russia is going to pay for it. Russian people are going to pay for it. The hatred will not go away for generations. Now, let me put this question to you, uh, ma'am, uh, Helga. First of all, <clears throat> I want your response uh, on what Dr. Nazir Mahmood said. Uh, the similarities and the differences as far as this particular war is concerned, if you compare it with Afghanistan, one. And secondly, ma'am, uh, it's not about occupation or, or, or the kind of power the Russians have. Now, it seems that uh, it is going to develop into a huge crisis because 2022 is going to be the year when, if you look at the figures and the kind of production you talk about, uh, the edible oil, you talk about energy resources, you talk about the production of wheat. These two countries put together uh, produce around uh, one third of the global uh, wheat. So you can well imagine the kind of problems that the world can face. And on top, the Americans are openly supporting uh, the, I would say, the people of uh, Ukraine in this regard. President Biden the other day visited uh, the factory where the javelins are made and that factory Obviously, they believe that they can multiply the production and uh, they'll double their production. So you can well imagine the resistance is going to be far more than what we are seeing at the moment. Your take? Well, I think the most important is to find a way to get peace immediately, not, not accept the idea that this will be a war which will go on for very long, because if that would happen, you know, there are some people who think that that war should be fought until the last Ukrainian. I think this is a very cynical approach. The main suffering people will be the Ukrainians. And, you know, there is right now in Germany a huge debate uh, which erupted because there were several open letters directed to Chancellor Scholz, one coming from uh, a group of intellectuals who warned that Germany should not uh, send heavy weapons to Ukraine because that implies the danger of the conflict going out of control and leading to World War III. And there is generally a, a recognition that, you know, if it comes to World War III, nobody will be left. Nobody in Germany, nobody in Pakistan, nobody in the United States. So there is a growing momentum of people who say we must have a negotiated diplomatic solution immediately. And I think that, you know, for example, if you have more weapons 
uh, I, I think the idea to exhaust Russia and to, you know, cause the crushing of Russia, which is what some people have said, like the uh, finance minister of France said, Le Maire, he had said, we have to crush, we have to finish off Putin, the Russian system. I think that kind of geopolitical thinking or the idea that you keep fighting until your, your enemy is completely destroyed, this will lead to World War III. And I think people should really rethink that. I think the uh, question of how did it come to this war is not so simple uh, as the previous speaker uh, made, it, uh, made it look. Because, you know, we have been, and I mean by we, I mean the Schiller Institute, we have been involved in a very close, uh, not only monitoring, but trying to shape the events for the last 30 years. Because you have to take all of this back to when the Soviet Union collapsed, when the, when the Russians then were extremely generous with Germany, agreeing to the peaceful unification of Germany, um, you know, after the wall came down. And it is now absolutely documented that James Baker III, the Secretary of General uh, of, of State at that time, uh, did promise to Gorbachev that NATO would not move one inch to the east. That, that there are many time witnesses for it. There are videotapes with uh, Genscher, the foreign minister of Germany at that time, who, who said the same thing. There are new documents in the archives. So it is very clear that, you know, when, when Putin says that they feel betrayed, he absolutely has a point because, you know, while, you know, there was a period in which you could have changed the world order to a peaceful one, which is what our program was at the time. We proposed the Eurasian land bridge as a basis for a peace order in 91. Um, you know, very soon certain forces said, OK, we are the only winner and they became very triumphant and said, you know, that basically uh, through regime change and color revolution, all the governments who do not agree to an unipolar world uh, should be removed. And we saw that, you know, Victoria Nuland uh, at one point uh, around the Maidan coup in 2014 uh, openly was bragging that the U.S. State Department spent $5 billion on NGOs and, you know, if you look at the recent publications in China, who published a very important white paper on the new um, uh, the NAD, the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, which is an organization which has been involved in every color revolution around the globe, in Hong Kong, in, you know, in, in Kazakhstan recently, in, in almost any attempt to regime change. You know, I mean, people are getting aware of the fact that this was a long battle. And, you know, when the coup in 2014 occurred, uh, this was, you know, basically uh, an attempt to, you know, change the government for the, for the you know, interest of, of NATO. And all this discussion that, that it was Russia who started to change the borders with, uh, you know, uh, occupying Crimea, that is not what happened. What happened was that the Nazi-infested government in 2014 outlawed the Russian language. And then as a consequence, the people in the Crimea made a referendum and said that they wanted to be part of Russia. And, you know, then there was an, a chance as for the fault of the West. In I mean, they have a share in why it came mm -hmm. to this because they did not enforce the Minsk agreement. There was no pressure put on Zelensky uh, to go along. And Zelensky was afraid of the right-wing so forces inside his own country. So he didn't go for it. Then, you know, there was no uh, no effort to, to, you know, make an issue of the fact that the Ukrainian forces for eight years had, you know, murdered 14,000 people in the Donbass. And, you know, Putin just today, uh, at the celebration of the 9th of uh, uh, May, said that this was an effort to preempt a major attack coming from the Ukrainian forces on the Donbas, and they had no other choice. Now, this is not just a Russian narrative, as it's always being discredited, because there are Western analysts in Italy, in France, in Switzerland, who have independently said that, you know, the uh, signs were 
uh, that the war did not start on February 24th, but it started on the 17th of February, because at that time, the you know signs increased that the Ukrainians would would absolutely escalate the attack on on the Donbas. So I'm saying this is a quite different story, uh, and you cannot say that it's all the fault of of Russia at all, because. You know, I mean, Russia demanded security guarantees again and again, and they were not listened to. So I just wanted to correct this narrative because I, I, I know it's being pushed right now, but it's not what really happened. Now, now quick comment uh, before I uh, put this other question to the other gentleman. Tell me what's exactly brewing in the power corridors in Finland and Sweden? because that is something very important and uh, this is what uh, we have been uh, watching and listening to on the television screens, and especially the Western, media. Western media. Yes, this is very dangerous too, because, you know, given the geographical position of uh, Finland and Sweden in the north, they are very close to, to Russia, um, that, you know, it, it, it almost brings about, again, the same thing what is the situation potentially with Ukraine, namely a reversed Cuban missile crisis. In the same way, like the United States would not like uh, Russian or Chinese missiles at the border of Mexico or the border of Canada, um, you know, the Russians are expressing concern that they don't want uh, NATO missiles uh, close to their border in the in the north, Finland or, or Sweden. The left party uh, in Sweden has uh, <clears throat> demanded a referendum, and the government now is basically not only denying a referendum, but they want to basically announce uh, in a few days, I think the end of this week on May 15th, their decision if uh, Sweden should should join NATO. And if they do, they probably do it together with Finland. But this goes completely over the heads of the Swedish population because I was just on the phone with a colleague in Sweden this morning and he told me that in Sweden you have an upheaval in the population which is not less than that in France or in Italy or in Germany over this question. So, you know, I think that it has nothing to do with a democratic decision. It, I think it has to do with these governments uh, caving into pressure from the US, from the British, from NATO, and the populations uh, sense it somehow. I think there is a, an earthquake going on right now in terms of a beginning rebellion of the population because they, they are not being asked. All right. Now, uh, right. Nazi no, Saab. Uh, Future of Black Sea. That's why they have Crimea. The Turkish government, we all know, they had old disputes with the Russians, despite the fact that if you look at the tourism coming in, uh, into Turkey from Russia, that is estimated well over $10 billion, $10 billion. You talk about the remittances, the Turkish workers who are working in Russia. Keep that aside. And then on top, sir, obviously, you're talking about a huge giant that is Russia, whether we like it or we don't. And then you talk about countries like Georgia, for that matter, and smaller countries in that region, sir. And then because I read about it and I got to know that Russians primarily control the region. But if you're talking about Black Sea and the exit into the mainland or the other side into the west, Turkey's role is going to be really important. But sir, when you look at Turkey and their relationship with the Americans, despite the fact that they are not the members of EU, but members of NATO, because they have a huge army. And then, you know, a couple of very interesting facts also, like um, UK for that matter is not a member of EU, but again is a member of uh, NATO. NATO. And there are certain countries which are the member of EU's, again, not members of NATO like Finland or, or Sweden for that matter. It's a very interesting mix out there, sir. Do you think these decisions are being taken on the individual basis according to the constitution of that particular country or as the lady said, uh, that uh, the American influence is so much that perhaps most of these uh, people or the decision makers, I would say, they do not have another choice? Well, you know, saying that uh this was only American fault that America expanded NATO. Uh, from 97, in 97, major uh, expansion of uh, NATO took place. 
And when that expansion took place, Russia did not object. President Boris Yeltsin was president, elected president of Russia. He could have objected at that time that we don't accept this expansion of NATO. Now, all these countries uh, from, as I mentioned, from Baltic to Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, uh, former Yugoslavia, all these countries were once under Soviet influence. Now, when these countries joined NATO, they had their own governments. And after that, there was no, from the public side, there is no opposition that these countries should get out of NATO. For example, in Pakistan, Pakistan in 1950s joined CETO and CENTO, but there was popular resistance. There were political parties in Pakistan which were opposing that Pakistan should not be part of CETO and CENTO. Not only in Pakistan, in Iran as well as in uh, Turkey yes, also. But what we see in uh, Eastern Europe, in Eastern Europe there was no popular movement against uh, joining of NATO and no, there have been successive governments. It has been more than 25 years and there have been successive governments and no government even discussed pulling out of NATO. What that means? That means the people of Eastern Europe, they were, they felt closer to European Union than Russia. Otherwise people would have said, no, we don't want, we want to be aligned with Russia. That was the point. So looking at the uh, Black Sea also, as you mentioned, if you look at the map of Black Sea, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, which have ports in the Black Sea, they are already part of NATO. So if NATO wants to do anything, NATO, uh, this Bulgaria and Romania are already there, they, they, they can do anything, but they are not doing it. So what Russia has done, Russia has practically blocked movement out of Ukrainian ports. And Mariupol is already under Russian occupation, Odessa is under attack, there are mines under the sea. So that is kind of a complete blockade. And that blockade uh, is not only military, this is economically suffocating Ukraine. Why? Because there are only in one port, there is one port, if you look at the map closer to Odessa, there is a port called Chernomorsk. Yeah, Ch in the south. Yes, Chernomorsk, Ch Chernom is in Russian, Cherno is black and more is sea. So the, the, the port itself called is Chernomorsk, the Black Sea port, so to say. And there is, there are 12 to 15 ships fully loaded with food grain Stuck there. To, stuck there and in a couple of months they, they will be rotten. What that means. And then within so Ukrainian there Our are... Harvesting has not taken place, has not taken place so far sir. That is another huge issue because you know our third guest interestingly which we have with us is an economist. And I think this question should be answered uh, from our third guest. Well, uh, coming to you now. One important uh, factor, Dr. Saab, is that, uh, as just mentioned uh, by our uh, friend Nazir Saab, uh, that uh, so many ships are stuck there with the grain. And obviously, any food item has a certain life. Sir, harvesting hasn't taken place. Exports haven't been made. And in the beginning of the program, I mentioned that about one third of the total wheat is produced in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, I was surprised to know that when you look at the Ukrainian flag, blue and then yellow. Yellow is for the crops, blue is for the uh, sky. So basically it's, a, it's an agro-based uh, country. Now so talking about uh, the year 2020, the supply chain is going to be disrupted. It is already disrupted by the way. Uh, export of uh, oil, uh, uh, export of uh, uh, fertilizer for that matter, Russia has around one-fifth of the fertilizer production and so much more going on. That is going to be a problem and a half, especially for countries like Pakistan. Food inflation is going to be the real problem along with the increasing price in uh, petroleum products. And uh, we are an importing country, sir. Oil importing country, grain importing country. What do you see ahead? Let's suppose three to four months from now. Okay, thank you for that question, Faisal Rahman. Thank you. Um, the biggest impact of Russia-Ukraine situation um, is inflation on top of a commodity super cycle that had come about due to the imbalance between supply and demand 
in large Western economies like the U.S. I mean, we know that inflation in U.S. and U.K. is at 40-year highs right now, when suddenly things got worse um, on the Russia-Ukraine front. And as, as you rightly mentioned, that this situation is going to lead to upward pressure on prices, especially energy, um, oil and gas, and on the prices of certain other commodities like wheat, primarily. Now, how is this going to impact countries of the global south like Pakistan? So I think the biggest impact that they have already seen, and we are going to see more of that in the future, is going to be um, higher prices at the pump, which, as you know, is going to bring about many knock-on effects. Now, let's look at some of the knock-on effects that are going to come about. So, very, very quickly, um, this increase in the price of oil is going to bite into households' real income. That is going to leave them with less money to spend on other things, and that is going to then uh, bring about a, a contraction uh, in, in the GDP. So, according to estimates, uh, because of these higher prices uh, for oil, and for wheat, there is going to be a general 1% reduction in GDP for many of the developing countries in the global south. There are going to be many other knock-on effects, but you specifically asked about commodity prices. You know, you basically mentioned wheat. So when it comes to, um, you know, this twin problem of higher oil prices and higher wheat prices, uh, we are going to see... Uh, higher commodity prices. We are going to see collapsing trade growth. We are going to see rising interest rates, stronger U.S. dollar, and all of these things together in the next three months cycle, are going to put more and more fiscal pressure on countries as they are going to find it very, very hard to manage mounting debts that they are accumulating. Um, so so the situation is, is, is a very challenging one for countries of the global south, because as you rightly pointed out, Russia and Ukraine combined account for 30% of the international wheat production. Um, there also appears to be a case that Russia may decide to use the supply of oil and gas as a political uh, weapon, which is going to keep the price of oil upwards of $105 per barrel. So mm -hmm. the next three months are going to be very, very challenging for countries of the global south, and and and, and I and I and I really hope that policymakers in Pakistan and other countries of the global south can really get their act together and go about tackling these challenges in a very uh, in a very efficient manner. Thank you. Now, a couple of more questions related to the same. Uh, let's talk about a country like Pakistan, sir. I'm not sure what exactly has happened uh, during this current visit of the Prime Minister along with his delegation when they went to Saudi Arabia. Initially, we thought that there's going to be a package of $8 billion. Now, they are still seeking mm -hmm. for certain, uh, I would say, uh, options uh, for that matter where uh, they could have a supply uh, of uh, fuel uh, on deferred payments, number one. Fuel prices, as you rightly mentioned, sir, it's well over $100 uh, uh, a barrel which could definitely go up in the future. One thing is for sure, sir, there's going to be an immediate price hike as far as the petroleum products is uh, concerned, sir. Uh, at the same time, the energy cost, when we talk about electricity, a couple of rupees, maybe more uh, per unit will be increased. Yes. Third factor, sir, the wheat production in Pakistan, if I'm not wrong, please, also please correct me, it's, it's, it's well under uh, the estimation and I think it's around 2.5 to 3 million tons negative. Uh, at the same time, when that's, you talk about, about price, edible yeah. oil, sir, we do import. And then there were sanctions in Indonesia and they were not uh, exporting yes. the edible oil, but perhaps they will show some relaxation. You talk about uh, fertilizer, sir. Again, 17% of the fertilizer production is in Russia. That is a very major component as far as agriculture is yes. concerned. Then you talk about uh, the import. Uh, 
obviously just like uh, LNG sir the more you pay the quicker you get the LNG or you wait for it uh, if you want to buy it on, on slightly lesser prices all these uh -huh. put together then a new government in, in place sir uh, when you look at the forex reserves of Pakistan hardly 10 billion in the State Bank of Pakistan which you can't even use otherwise you just need to keep them there and I mean there's a long list inflation is the last important factor uh, I was just going through an article currently it is believed uh, to be around 12.5 uh, to 13.5 uh, and 15 is the yeah. estimation in the coming uh, let's say until the budget and it could go up to 20 percent inflation sir you rightly mentioned 40 percent 40 years um, I mean as far as UK or US is concerned highest ever in the last 40 years so you can well imagine the overall impact uh, what is that supposed to mean sir that seems to be pretty disastrous isn't it yes it is going to be an unprecedented economic challenge um, something that we haven't faced as a society and as a nation in over a generation. I think uh, the last time uh, people in this part of the world faced such situation was probably during the 1970s with the oil embargoes. Uh, but, you know, th these are unprecedented uh, economic times that not only Pakistan but the rest of the world is also facing. Now, there are certain things that can be done in order to tackle these very uh, significant economic challenges. And if you like, I can give you um, a few things that our policymakers may, may want to consider if they want to effectively deal with these upcoming economic headwinds. Serious issues in the future. Well. We have been hearing that Pakistan is passing through, bad, through a bad phase. How long will it take? God knows. Coming back to you, okay, uh, so, so. Ms. Helga. Now, I have a question for you and that seems to be pretty important in one way or the other. And that is uh, about the payment of the fuel that is used or consumed by the Europeans in rubles. Uh, well, uh, I was surprised and rather impressed also in a way when I learned that uh, the trade between Russia and China since 2014 onwards, this has been around $220 billion. That's unbelievable. But ma'am, looking at uh, just one trading partner with Russia uh, is not going to serve the purpose. Obviously, sanctions are there to paralyze the economic activities. A lot has happened to the Russians, but ma'am, it has to come to an end sooner or later. The sooner, the better, I would say. The point is that most of these European countries, they are much richer than countries in the South Asia or Africa for that matter. Where will it lead? Do you think the global powers or the decision makers sitting at the top should also consider about the food shortage and especially about the hunger. According to one of the reports, they say that uh, cash-trapped countries particularly are vulnerable to disruptions, number one. Soaring food, inflation, raising poverty and undernourishment. Undernourishment. Your take, ma'am. Well, the United Nations World Food Program, they have warned that uh, as a result of all of these things, the pandemic, the war, the sanctions, 1.7 billion people are in danger of uh, food insecurity and famine. Now that's 20% of the world population. And I think that that should really be a warning sign you know, for countries to get together and really try to solve this. Because if, it's, if you take a confrontational approach, which is happening now, uh, you know, the sanctions against Russia, the EU has just uh, made the sixth package of sanctions and what is the effect of it? Naturally, Russia must turn to Asia. So they have now negotiations between Russia and China uh, to set up a new credit system, uh, which sounds very on, based on sound principles, you know, basically to have capital controls, to have <clears throat> uh, credit generation for physical economy only to curb 
uh, any kind of speculation. And that is the kind of change which should occur because the Western neoliberal system is in a hyperinflationary collapse. There is Correct. no way how this will be stopped. I can see that the entire Western system is about to blow out like it blew out in Germany in 1923 when you had a hyperinflation. The only difference is this time it's not in one country like in Weimar Germany at the time, but it's the entire transatlantic sector plus those countries who are having a, a liberal, a neoliberal system. So what is happening between Russia and China right now uh, is, you know, to go to uh, trade in in the national currencies, to set up new banks, a new uh, credit mechanism, and more and more countries will be attracted to that. Uh, the effort to get to get certain countries of the global south to condemn Russia did not function. India did not take a position, even when Prime Minister Modi went to Europe right now, he did not join the EU or the West in condemning Russia because India says they want to be not pulled in. They, they have a typical non-aligned position, which is very good. Indonesia does not capitulate. Uh, the IMF put enormous pressure on Indonesia not to invite Putin to the upcoming G20 summit in November, but Indonesia mm. is, is not uh, doing that. Even Brazil, Bolsonaro, does not want to uh, side with the United States, but he wants to have a, a neutral position. And if the next president of Brazil is Lula, uh, then the entire BRICS uh, you know, mechanism will, will gain even more power. South Africa did not want to join with the West. And the head of uh, South Africa, Ramaphosa, uh, said it was NATO's fault that it came to this. The same goes for Nigeria. So what I see is that if the West is continuously to go for confrontation, there may be a break between the Western world and, you know, the countries which are around Russia and China. And, you know, that will be very dangerous. I think it will be the absolute economic catastrophe for Europe. If Europe goes ahead with an embargo against oil and, and gas against Russia, mm -hmm. It will ruin Europe much, much more than Russia. And there are many CEOs of major corporations who are saying exactly that because there is no way how uh, how uh, Germany can compensate uh, for the lack of uh, uh, Russian gas. I think we have to have a different approach. On the food question, you know, uh, if the United States would agree to uh, reduce the amount of grain uh, going into ethanol by only 50 percent, it would completely compensate for all of the Ukrainian wheat being exported. So the United States should just do that. Governments should get together and say we have a, a famine of 1.7 billion people. We must agree to double food production. I mean, this can be done if the governments would decide to give credit and you know, fertilizer and machinery and, and everything needed to the farms, food production could be doubled. And that's, I think, what needs to be done because you have major catastrophes in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in many other countries. We Absolutely. expect a growing, Absolutely. We expect a growing pop world mm. population. For example, by 2050, Africa will have 2.5 billion people. So we need to increase world food production and the EU is not helping because they are refusing uh, I think most of the money the that is spent, is spent in, in unfortunately in wars should be in, in fact diverted towards the food security. Last yes. comment uh, from you, Nazir Saab, please. Well, I think that, you know, uh, no matter whatever economic considerations are, aggression is aggression. A aggression needs to be condemned. You know, uh, if, if condemnation does not mean that you go and join the war, at least verbal condemnation is there. So if India is not condemning aggression or Pakistan is not condemning aggression, Russia is the aggressor at this particular moment. We have opposed whenever America is aggressor, we oppose that. All right. Sir. So two wrongs don't make a right. All right, Nazir Saab, thank you very much for your for your comments. Uh, Ma'am Zelga, it was a, a pleasure having you in the program. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Agdas Afzal Saab, uh, for your comments. And that's all we have uh, for this hour. Inshallah, I'll see you tomorrow at 8 or 5 p.m. Till then, you take good care of yourself. Khuda Hafiz.